until the pandemic came and hit us, I think a lot of people were not quite so aware as to how much our lives are impacted by global events that might start anywhere. This is a real crisis. I mean, it's been clear that this was likely to spread in the U.S. We need to be thinking much more ambitiously. Climate finance is a very big issue. We, the Center for Global Development, we're a group that try and see how we can make the international system that supports global development work more effectively. CGD came about because it was time to focus not only on what developing countries should do, but much more on what the rich world should do. How do we finance infrastructure in the poorest parts of the world? How do we increase productivity in agriculture? What kind of policy brings out the best outcomes? Some of our previous work has helped to come up with a kind of innovative financing mechanism that was used to help launch pneumococcal vaccines. We really have researchers and experts here at CGD who come at these issues from multiple vantage points and I think that's just what helps make our research more rigorous, more rich and actually more connected to the realities that decision makers are grappling with. We've been looking to CGD for all of your research and analysis uh, to guide us. So CGD is nonpartisan. Because of that, over the years, that credibility has given us significant convening power. Our government highly values the work. What CGD is about is you can ask those difficult questions that people refuse to ask and actually find solutions. We're thinking about how climate change will impact migration patterns, how that will in turn have impacts on people's health. It's challenging to be able to align budget with ambitious programmatic goals, but it can be done. Every single time that we're able to get it right, it means you know, we're reducing significant poverty. If you can help to make things a little bit better, that's a good way to spend your time. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to the Center for Global Development. My name is Javier Guzman. I'm the director of the Global Health Program, and it is a pleasure to be with you to discuss a very important issue, antimicrobial resistance. So as you might know, antimicrobial resistance is one of the biggest global public health threats facing humanity. We now know that almost 5 million people die globally with an infection that is resistant to the drugs used to treat it every year. And a quarter of those, about 1.3 million, die because of antimicrobial resistance. You know, that's more deaths than HIV AIDS or than malaria. And unfortunately, we are behind on the solutions. And unfortunately, the burden falls heavily on the world's poor. Um, a child under age five in Africa is 58 times more likely to die from AMR than a child of the same age yeah, in a high income country. And of course, there are many reasons why, you know, antimicrobial resistance is a problem. You can talk about the human issues, the animal issues, the environmental issues. And of course, there are many important solutions like access to water, access to sanitation, infection prevention and control. But today here, we're going to talk about antibiotics and we're going to talk about how antibiotics are procured, are purchased. Um, and that is why, um, and that is because we think, you know, the current system is, is not fit for purpose. The current system is basically a volume-based system. It's currently a system where the manufacturers are paid per medicine sold. And that, of course, we know incentivizes overuse, incentivizes inappropriate use, and provides insufficient incentives to develop new antimicrobials. Um, so join me today and join um, our team um, group, of, group of panelists to discuss new ways to procure antibiotics, especially in low and middle income countries. We're taking the opportunity to launch a new working group. We call this new working group a new grand bargain for antimicrobial procurement, especially, you know, enhancing access to worship and innovation for antimicrobials in low and middle income countries. So welcome. And first, we're going to have a short presentation 
Um, and then we'll get into the discussion with our panelists. But before I start, I want to introduce um, our first presenter, our presenter who is um, Anthony McDonald. Um, Anthony is a senior policy analyst within the Global Health Program at CGT and is the technical lead of the working group. So Anthony, welcome and please take us through the presentation. Over to you. Great, thank you very much, Javier. And you should hopefully now all be able to see my slides. Um, so I want to discuss a recent piece of research that we launched on Tuesday, a landscape for review of current and potential market structures for antimicrobials. Uh, I am presenting the research today, but I want to say that I, this is done uh, with Javier, who you just met, and also Catherine Klemper and Morgan Pincombe, who are two excellent researchers that did an awful lot of this work. Uh, so first of all, the problem. As Javier just said, uh, paying for antimicrobials by pill encour encourages overselling um, and conservation efforts to keep the volume of sales low um, makes the return on investment often very small. Um, and this makes antimicrobials quite different from other medicines where you don't have societal harm for overselling. Um, and this, uh, this leads to a too small a return on investment for innovation and also not enough protection of the drugs we have. If resistance were to rise, the economics might change. However, at this point, it will take a long time to come up with a new drug. Uh, coming up with an antimicrobial takes about 10 years. Um, and unlike COVID, we probably don't have anything in reserve to make new antimicrobials quickly because we would already have created them. Uh, it is like climate change in a way, it's a slow burning problem that requires global coordination. And so uh, we did two parts to our recent research. First of all, we had a systematic review um, and this was based on a search of peer reviewed journals uh, focused on procurement. Uh, we looked at uh, search terms for anti-infective resistance procurement and policy came up in the paper. Uh, and any paper since 2014, or if it had an implementation or a uh, ALMIC term, low and middle income country term, including the name of any low and middle income country, and it came up before 20, uh, at, at any point in time. This led to uh, almost 7,000 papers, uh, which were screened, um, and we also researched the websites and reports of, of key organizations. All of this detail is in, in the paper. Um, and so what did we find? First of all, the literature is heavily focused on high income countries. 49% uh, of papers in our search focus exclusively on high income countries. And that's despite us having extra terms to find the low and middle income country focused papers. 38.5% uh, mention both high income and low and middle income countries. Uh, about half of these focus on them equally and about half of them seem to mention low and middle income countries in passing. And just 9.9% uh, focus exclusively on low and middle income countries. And these uh, images are scaled in their respective proportion by height, which is a theme that you'll see more of. 94.5% um, of papers had a, an author who was based in a high income country, uh, but just 12.5% of papers had a, an author based in a lower middle income country. And so why does this matter? Well, first of all, uh, Almost 85% of the world's population is based in a lower middle income country. Uh, almost 89% of deaths from resistance uh, occur in low and middle income countries. Um, the average person who dies in a high income country of resistance, the Lancet uh, report that came out this year, they estimate loses 17 years of life versus 40 years of life for somebody in a low and middle income country and more than 60 years of life for somebody in sub-Saharan Africa. But what that means is that almost 95% of life years lost because of drug resistant infections are in low and middle income countries. Um, and well over 99% of children under five who die of antimicrobial resistance die in low and middle income countries. Uh, more than a quarter of a million children die before they're five. Uh, most of these are in sub-Saharan Africa, just over half and about half of these are in the first 30 days of life. There are actually two images here, but as they're scaled, it is almost impossible to see the second one. Um, uh, authors from low and middle income countries also have very different perspectives. Uh, we found that they are much more likely to focus on restrictive prescribing, to look at financial incentives for prescribers in areas like stewardship, 
and to look at diagnostic confirmation models, in, in part because uh, health resources are more limited and so using diagnostics is, is more important in lower middle income countries. And they are less likely to look at tax incentives and increasing reimbursement for antibiotics. So the fact that we have research skewed towards high income country needs uh, leaves uh, a lot of the areas important to low and middle income countries behind. I want to say at this point too that we recognize that not all high, low and middle income countries are the same. They vary hugely based on wealth, uh, on population size, on healthcare system, on state capacity, on burden of drug resistant infections. Uh, but the papers aren't focusing on them are so limited, we find it very difficult to draw out conclusions based on different types of low and middle income countries. Most of the papers are also focused on middle income countries rather than low income countries. As well as a literature review, we did an interview with 28 people. Um, we identified interviewees based on a combination of authors in the literature review search, our own contacts, and asking interviewees who else we should speak to. People came from academia, uh, funding organizations, healthcare, the pharmaceutical industry, and policymakers. Um, seven people were based in low and middle income countries. Uh, 12 were based in high income countries not focused on development. And this included some organizations uh, that have large development arms, but are not solely focused on development, such as, say, Carbex or the Wellcome Trust. And then we had development focused organizations such as, uh, um, as uh, funders or somebody like CGD would have been categorized in this, in this space that we, we were not interviewed ourselves. Um, and while there were only seven people based in low and middle income countries, I want to say, first of all, there were many other low and middle income country authors. Uh, they just didn't live. Uh, they lived in high income countries. And secondly, our search strategy and a lower response rate from low and middle income countries led to there being less people than we would have liked from this region. And that was uh, something that uh, we, we ought to have done better. Um, but what did the interviewees find? Uh, first of all, um, there were uh, a wide consensus that stewardship is important, regardless of whether somebody is based in a low and middle income country or they're non-development or development focused high income country person. But there was a huge difference in terms of emphasis on access and emphasis on innovation. People in high income countries overwhelmingly thought innovation was a priority, if not their priority to tackling antimicrobial procurement while people in low income countries and particularly those in development focused institutions tended to put access first. Uh, I wouldn't read too much into the specific numbers here, but there was an overall trend that all interviewers uh, recognized. Um, uh, um, that, uh, as one interviewee told us, there is a divergence of interest between those in the global north and the global south. The Global North is interested in new antibiotic production, research and development, stewardship and surveillance. This is being done to identify threats to the Global North, not to help the Global South. The Global South is more interested in infection burden and reducing infectious disease. Another interviewee told us that they don't see the need for new uh, innovation in antimicrobials uh, for their country because they are unlikely to get the drugs anyway and access is thus much more important to them. Um, there were areas of consensus. Uh, everyone agreed that a new system is needed to purchase antimicrobials because of the problems that Javier and I both outlined, uh, that it should be based on ability to pay um, with whether there's one system or multiple systems. Most people felt high income countries should fund the majority of, of new innovation and that low income countries should probably pay the cost of antimicrobials or, or less and have their antimicrobials be subsidized. Uh, but not fund innovation. And there was a little bit of divergence on, on the role of middle income countries in funding innovation. Um, and there was widespread agreement that the political obstacles are the main barrier to progress. While the economics of antimicrobials needs to be fixed um, for the market to function and for us to get the access, the innovation and the stewardship that we need, uh, we need politicians um, and governments to put those policies into place. And so this is what CGD's new working group um, is, is going to look at. Uh, we need to balance access, stewardship, and innovation. Because access without stewardship um, leads to antibiotics uh, succumbing to resistance very quickly, and it, uh, and it may undermine in, uh, innovation if we don't build that into a policy. Stewardship without access can, uh, means that people won't get the drugs that they need, and it will undermine innovation by not 
creating uh, the incentives to create new drugs. And if we have innovation without the other two, we're liable to lead to an unjust situation where the drugs exist, but people do not have access um, and that they are wasted uh, because other people use them too much. So we're delighted to, uh, to have brought together so many leading experts uh, uh, to discuss these problems um, and to achieve access, innovation and stewardship will re require global coordination and which is why we brought people from across the world together in this discussion because the world needs a new purchasing system or systems for antimicrobials and we want to understand exactly what this is. And I want to say at this point there are many areas of antimicrobial resistance that need to be solved such as infection control, use in animals, uh, environmental waste, and we fully recognize that, but this project is specifically focused on access, innovation, and stewardship of new antibiotics. Um, uh, and then uh, finally, we need a system of separate but complementary rights and responsibilities for low and middle income countries and high income countries, because uh, any one country cannot uh, create innovation on its own, most likely, um, and we all suffer if there's too much, if there's not enough stewardship of antimicrobials, because as with COVID infections cross borders, um, and anyone who believes in justice ought to believe in a world where, where drugs exist, the people who need them have access to them. So that should be the center of any solution. Um, so the next steps, we are funding to this project, three country case studies, one in India, one in Brazil, and a third one to be determined. Uh, this led by the Indian School of Business and INCAE and Julian Alberta Ortezi, who's a researcher in Brazil. Um, and uh, we also have funding to run a range of smaller research projects that fill research gaps that we've identified. A lot of the, the case studies and a lot of the research will be led by low and middle income country based people because we recognize that, uh, that we need to move away from, from people in richer parts of the world leading research projects in this space. And we will have a draft report for public consultation published in April uh, of next year. Um, and then a final report uh, to come out in September, 2023 at the UN General Assembly. Uh, and while we have specific members of our, our um, working group, we want to cast a wider net in people we engage with. And so please get in touch if you have any thoughts, questions or comments, either during the later talk today or in general, we are happy to reach out and chat to everyone. Thank you very much, Javier, back to you. Thank you very much, Anthony. Uh, thank you for highlighting the unbalances, unbalances on burden, unbalances on research, unbalances on solutions, unbalances on you know, perceptions and you know, different approaches. Um, so with that frame, with that background, um, it is a pleasure to introduce um, our panel today. Um, first, we have um, Fatima Rafiki, a Research Program Manager for the Antimicrobial Resistance Benchmark uh, work that is conducted you know, at the um, Medicines Foundation. Um, welcome um, and congratulations on the report you just launched. Um, we also have Kevin um, Otterson. He is the Executive Director of CARP. X. Um, he's a professor at the Boston University of School, School of Law. Um, we have Murphy uh, Mpundu, director of React Africa. And last but not least, we have Rachel Silverman Bonifield, uh, policy fellow at the Center for Global Development. So thank you very much for joining. Thank you very much for accepting the invitation. Now we're going to have a conversation about you know um, the work we'll be doing, the problem, the solutions, and I wanted to start off with you know a very high level question um, for you all. You know we heard from Anthony about um, the importance of innovation, stewardship, and access, and I want to ask you: Should we really be talking about the three, um, and why should we be talking about the three? Um, what are your thoughts and? And Fatima, maybe we can start with you. Welcome. Thank you. Um, no, it's a, it's a very important question and something that we work to address in the recent paper that we put out a few weeks ago, where we looked into why it's important for companies to not only be innovative towards developing new drugs, making sure that they have the right practices in place um, and guidelines for stewardship, um, 
along with the other stakeholders responsible for that, but also making sure that they're providing access to these medicines. And the reason why access to these medicines is important is, as you've highlighted, um, 1.27 million people are dying um, from lack of access to medicines and resistant infections. And so the majority of these in LMICs and the majority of these don't have access to these medicines. And so when we did the um, AMR benchmark in November, we found that of the 131 generic medicines that were available, only 34 of these medicines actually had access strategies for low and middle income countries associated with them. So that's only um, a very small number of what's actually available and seven out of 10 um, on patent medicines had access available to them to low and middle income countries. So that's a very stark divide. And so um, while it's important to make sure that these drugs are protected, while it's important to make sure that there's innovation, it's equally important to make sure that people actually have access to these medicines, but also the right medicines at the right time in order order to prevent the spread of AMR. Thank you very much. Um, and yes, we'll be, you know, we can include um, a link to your report um, here so everyone in, you know, the different platforms can have a look. And uh, let me take the opportunity to ask you all, you know, who are watching this event to submit your questions using the platforms you're in after, you know, um, the initial conversation we'll get you know, um, your questions and we'll provide answers. But Kevin, I mean, you've been on this space for a very long time um, and you're an expert in this field. Does it feel like um, we should be talking about the three innovations, stewardship and access in the same conversation? Um, is this, you know, um, appropriate? What are your thoughts? Why this is important? So I'm delighted um, to be talking about them together because that, that diagram came from an article that Stephen Hoffman and I did seven or eight years ago now. And, and sometimes people look at it and say that these three are in opposition. And the entire point of the, the diagram is that there are ways for us to do all three of these together in a mutually supportive way. Uh, because uh, we do have a global access problem. What, a, what an indictment on our global justice if, if, if not only new antibiotics, but the generic antibiotics aren't getting to the people for whom it would save their lives today around the world. And, and for the new antibiotics, uh, you know, even high income countries, in the report that we put out this uh, last year, uh, high income countries in Europe um, are, are not getting access to the newer antibiotics and it's much worse than the rest of the planet. So we have an imperative to make sure people get these antibiotics, uh, but that um, they're, they're used effectively um, and that we take good care of them. Um, I'm also excited by the what Anthony mentioned, because a lot of this work is focused in the high income world. A lot of my work has for sure. And I'm delighted that there'll be three case studies here focused on non high income countries led by by other people who are, who are you know, working within those those settings. Uh, I'm excited to learn uh, from that process. Thank you very much, Kevin. And yes, thank you very much for, you know, thinking about these issues and, you know, we're building from a lot of the work that you've done. Um, Murphy, you know, you, you've been working in Africa for a very long time um, on these issues. Were, were you surprised to see, you know, these reactions to, you know, the, the question on uh, innova innova innovation, stewardship and access? Uh, what, what, what is your take about the, the balance between the three? Uh, thank you so much, and, uh, and thank you for uh, this great invitation and the work that uh, you have ventured in. Absolutely, you know, the, so these three cannot, <laughs> cannot exist in separation. And I think uh, uh, Kevin, I think, has, has alluded to that uh, uh, quite well. From the practical side of things, and why these are important, uh, one is that uh, there is a lot of lack of access and a lot of people are dying from lack of access to actually antibiotics uh, than to antimicrobial resistance itself or to antibiotic resistance. I think Fatima was able to give us some statistics uh, uh, to that effect. The second thing is that uh, in most low and middle income countries, there's a chronic shortage of um, really quality assured and essential 
antibiotics, uh, that could uh, uh, that could bring healing and make a change, a change in terms of uh, 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 in terms of their health status. We we also have a situation where that uh, there are no diagnostics um, that can be used, and in most of the running health facilities that are in major cities, you do have labs. But I mean, most of those labs are. Uh, it's a chronic um, issue that they don't have uh, any consumables. We do not have very rapid diagnostic tests that can be used to treat uh, a really a simple UTI, upper respiratory tract infections. And so it forces um, uh, clinicians um, to be able to, uh, to use antibiotics uh, uh, because they don't know what they are treating. And so when we're looking at actually innovation, the other part of it is that uh, the pipeline has been dry. You know, there have not been any new antibiotics coming out of the pipeline. And most of the pharmaceutical industries, uh, they've exited the market. You know, in 2017, uh, uh, the cost of producing an antibiotic was put at about 1.5 billion. But what was coming out um, uh, in, terms, in terms of revenue was about 46 million uh, US dollars. And so, and so you look at that disparity, it it does not inspire the pharmaceutical industry to, um, to go through that. The other side of things is that uh, there are two issues. There's the, a real over-reliance. If you don't have the first line treatment, second line treatments, uh, what ends up happening is that um, really clinicians over-rely on two or three molecules. Now, ceftriaxone, which has been a darling antibiotics for most of the doctors in low and middle income countries, uh, uh, we are seeing resistant patterns to over 90%. We are fast losing ceftriaxone uh, at the rate that is very alarming. Uh, the other point that I should, I should mention why we need to talk about actually access stewardship and, uh, you know, and, uh, and actually innovation is the fact that uh, there is also the other extreme of overuse. Easy access to these antibiotics uh, uh, there is overuse, and that overuse, of course, actually influences and it fuels actually antimicrobial resistance. And so, and so for a start, you know, there's there's no way we can actually delink um, innovation, you know, new molecules coming in, diagnostics. We can actually delink that from stewardship, ensuring that I mean these molecules are being used appropriately uh, for patients who need them in the right quantities and also that are affordable. But also ensuring that uh, you know uh, we don't forget about uh, uh, the issues of access, which is a major, major problem. Access is a major problem that we are currently facing in most low-income countries and middle-income countries. Thank you. Thank you, Merfin, and and thank you for you know putting some you know numbers and reality to the situation with uh, ceftriaxone and you know the the key molecules that low and middle income countries rely on Rachel what was your take on on, on the three you know um, elements of this conversation you've done a lot of work on global procurement of, of medicines and overall on you know research and development and incentives should we be talking about these three at the same time over to you Great. Thank you, Javier. I think we have to, and for some of the reasons already highlighted by other panelists, but maybe to just sort of sum it up pretty simply, innovation is itself an access issue. That will be the difference at some point about whether you can access any drug that, uh, that is, will treat your, your infection. Um, there, it's not the only access issue. It won't be at that point, but if there is no drug that exists that can treat your infection, you do not have access to effective antibiotics. So innovation is an access issue. Stewardship is an access issue because stewardship is not just about restricting access to antibiotics. It's also about making sure that you have appropriate use of antibiotics. And appropriate use means using antibiotics when you need them, when they are needed. So stewardship is also about access when it's done right, when it's not just seen as let's prevent access from antibiotics, but it's actually seen as let's use these antimicrobials in the optimal way, which means not overusing them, not misusing them, but indeed using them when they are needed. And that's an access issue. 
And then access is also a stewardship issue, which is what uh, Mirfin was just highlighting, which is that if you only have access to a handful of antibiotics, you don't have the choice of going to second and third line drugs necessarily. You might be stuck treating partially resistant uh, infections with a combination therapy that only has one drug that is efficacious against uh, the infection. And that's going to increase the risk that you are going to expand the resistance to that. So these have to be interconnected issues. I mean, not just because we care about all of them, but because they are actually mutually reinforcing. Now, that doesn't mean there's not tensions between them sometimes. And I think when you talk about prescribing policy, you talk about kind of what needs to be in place, uh, presumptive treatment versus uh, uh, testing and better diagnosis. You do run into some tensions, but fundamentally, these are also reinforcing qualities and you need to have that entire conversation to have effective antimicrobial policy. Thank you, Rachel. I mean, it's interesting how you said, you know, these are interconnected and mutually reinforcing. So now that we are all on the same page about, you know, the, the need to talk about innovations to achieve an access um, in the same conversation, I, I wanted to talk about, you know, the solution because, you know, we have clearly said, you know, there is a problem and the solution will have to have these three elements. Um, how, how do you all envision a new system to purchase antibiotics in low and middle income countries? And, and let, let's, let's start with Kevin, because Kevin, you might also want to comment on, you know, the new um, announcements that we've heard about, you know, GARP with, you know, a, 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 a Japanese pharmaceutical company with the Clinton Access Initiative. Like, how do you envision a new system? What, what are the features of a new system and how the, the current developments do match those features? Over to you, Kevin. Well, we probably need one system for the generic drugs and one for the brand new ones. But uh, let's talk about Cefetrocol. You know, new drug, it's on the WHO, it'll be on the reserve list. Um, and uh, it's, it's brand new. And Shinogi took an amazing step by instead of holding on to the IP and holding it tight, um, you know, they have a license now with Guard P uh, for most of the world um, in which Guard P will, tech transfer is happening now, Guard P will have the power to, to, to lead on the, on the distribution, access, stewardship, everything for this drug for most of the world uh, with the help of the of Clinton uh, Health Access Initiatives as well. So, so a lot is going to be learned on this project. It, it needs to be well-funded. Um, you know, it, it's in conjunction, I think, with the SECURE initiative. It's one way of thinking about that from WHO. Uh, this need, the world needs this to succeed and to do really well. And we're going to learn a lot from it on how do we roll out a new drug to the whole world, not just to the high income world. So kudos mm -hmm. uh, to this project. And, um, and I'm, I'm grateful and, and excited to see it. On the, on the generic front, you know, the, the global um, people who fund procurement, you know, so governments who do procurement for a generic antibiotic or UNICEF who's trying to buy antibiotics for, uh, for settings around the world, I think typically those procurements have focused on lowest price. And, and we may need to be thinking about some other things too, so that the supply chain is secure, so that the quality assurance is there and, and that we have something ongoing for the ecosystem. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for making, you know, the, the explicit, um, making the difference between generics and, and innovative medicines explicit. Um, Fatima, do you, do you have comments on, on what this new system should be uh, in relation to both generics and, and, and new medicines? Any, any comment? Over to you. No, of course. And just to piggyback on Kevin's um, response with respect to um, the importance of not only price being taken into consideration by procurement agencies, but also the supply chain. And if that's an issue that we've learned from COVID-19 is that we have to make sure that um, we are not only selecting or there, uh, the selection of suppliers is not only based on um, the selection of suppliers is based on reliability and sustainability and transparency and making sure that we have um, the right level of information as well from governments in terms of demand and consumption in order to be able to reach the right populations. And so 
when developing out a system, um, there are a host of different elements to take into consideration, regulatory requirements. Um, as I mentioned, understanding local resistance patterns, surveillance information, making sure that when you are pricing, that you're pricing based on ability to pay, and then also making sure that the supply chain is going to be sustainable um, and stable. Thank you. I guess what you're saying is that a lot of it is fixing um, fundamental procurement problems, fundamental issues related to um, regulatory capacity, um, to mm -hmm. um, demand forecasting, to systems to, serve, to, 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 to provide adequate surveillance. Um, Murphy, do you think that you know, this, is, uh, this new system um, needs to be different for antimicrobials? Uh, what are the features of this system? What are the features that need to be different or special because of you know, the medicines we're talking about? Uh, thank you. So um, this, this, this is a very important question and an important discussion. Uh, I think there are certain things that need to be in place. I mean, fundamentally, we, we agree that uh, in, you know, access um, is an issue. We, we agree that uh, the, uh, the current R&D uh, uh, model is, uh, is, is probably not the best. It has not been uh, uh, really actually working. There is, uh, I think what we need to see, you know, uh, a couple of things is that uh, we need to see really greater transparency, uh, uh, transparency of the global supply chains and increased capacity uh, really around procurement, but also, you know, creating more uh, uh, diversification in terms of API manufacturing, which currently is limited to very few countries uh, uh, that produce actually APIs. Uh, in the African region, for example, you know, uh, there are no APIs that are produced. I mean, the only crude uh, uh, is really a testimony, you know, uh, that is exported out as crude and then reimported back into, into, um, into the region. And so, uh, when we're looking at, uh, you know, uh, these issues, it would be important to have a, uh, really clear procurement practices uh, that, uh, you know, uh, uh, for actually anti, you know, and I'm not sure that uh, uh, probably, I'm not sure probably Kevin, and I think probably this is where probably I, I might, uh, uh, I might have a bit of a different opinion with my good friend Kevin about the separation of brand and, uh, you know, you know really, and generics. Because at the end of the day, if all we have are brand and they are not in a generic form, then I think we should consider that to be accessible really anywhere around the world. I think the challenge is that we, you know, uh, uh, we're gonna face, um, and these are some of the real ones, uh, you know, include how do we ensure that, uh, you know, uh, 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 for example, which is registered uh, uh, in the U.S., is gonna be is gonna be affordable uh, in Bangladesh. It will be affordable in China. It will be affordable in Malawi. It's gonna be affordable in uh, uh, in Tuvalu. You know, how do we ensure as a global community to ensure that uh, you know these molecules that are coming out are actually affordable? And one way, you know, it's uh, you know. Uh, we have to diversify and change the manufacturing uh, uh, way and also actually address some of the bottlenecks uh, in the supply chain. But also I think it's important that, uh, you know, uh, we look at uh, uh, how will, because, you know, the, uh, the current uh, uh, models of procurement, I mean, put procurement for UNICEF has worked well because again, again as mentioned earlier on, they buy at low price and they pull resources. One of the challenges that low and middle income countries have is that their volumes of procurement are not that competitive, you know, compared to high income countries. And uh, really a lot of times they end up on the back of the line. We saw what happened with the COVID vaccine in Botswana, again, you know, paid for high income countries in front of the line. They didn't until, until, until we had actually that actually the Omicron uh, uh, variant. And so, you know, we, uh, there are critical elements that uh, we need to move to the delinkage model that, you know, you know, 
uh, these incentives, I think we'll get into that discussion, you know, uh, around like market entry rewards, around, around the current models that are being proposed. Yeah, uh, uh, but fundamentally, I think the key issues are that uh, we have to be sensitive to uh, regions and countries that do not have certain capacities and that cannot produce, uh, that will rely on importation, but also address, address the whole transparency uh, uh, that is in R&D, but also uh, the issues of APIs. Thank you. Thank you, Murphy. I guess what Kevin was alluding to, I was getting at, is the difference between single source and yeah. multi-source. Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, I think what you said in terms of let's talk about delinking volume, volume from price is, is one of the key elements that we also think about when we think of a new system. Uh, Rachel, what, what are your views on, on this new system? What, what are the features? What should we be thinking of uh, when you know designing that new system for it to be successful? Over to you, Rachel. Thanks, Javier. So it's interesting to think about this as a global system because ultimately we're talking about many different buyers here. Um, and so the, the concept of a grand bargain is, okay, are we going to agree together to some joint rules of the game, even if we're not uh, joining into a broader system? And I think there's a number of different considerations that are, are, are all intertwined and makes it a challenging issue as I'm, everyone here is very well aware. I mean, so one is the question of procurement policy in general, and this is to a large extent what Fatima was, was getting at, which is that there's a number of structural procurement problems in many low and middle income countries. And I think when we're talking about uh, off patent generic antimicrobials, we really are in the world primarily of just procurement policy, and not necessarily a special procurement policy, just our, our governments, our purchasers, our private sector distributors purchasing effectively. Um, and that gets to sort of these deeper structural questions that need to be answered, but I don't know that they're necessarily antimicrobial specific. Um, but then when you talk about these new um, antimicrobials, I think there's a fundamental question of which, if any, low and middle income countries want to be not just purchasing antimicrobials, but active players in shaping the market for antimicrobials in a way that's going to meet their needs. Because the burden of disease from infectious disease in India looks very different from the burden of infectious disease in Europe and the United States. Sure. And even if India gets access to every single antimicrobial developed for Europe and for the United States, that does not necessarily mean that India's needs will be fulfilled. Now, India is a large country. It is a diverse country. It is obviously not as wealthy as, uh, as Europe or the United States, but the collective size of its market is very, very large. If it decided it wants to be an active player in shaping this market to get the kinds of drugs it needs, it can do so. Um, but there are other countries out there who do not have that luxury, even if they decided to be active players, where their size is too small, their uh, economies are too small to necessarily play that role. Maybe in a group, in a regional purchasing block, they could start to get into that kind of space, but they are, they are going to be mostly market takers. Um, it's going to be hard for them to shape the market. So to me, I think, depending on where you find yourself in this sort of uh, paradigm, and among these different, these different considerations, it's going to depend a little bit on what you're thinking. So personally, I am partial to a tiered pricing model for antimicrobials, not because I think it's important in a normative sense that say India or Brazil pay for antimicrobials or pay for R&D, but because I think that is what needs to happen for the market to take their health needs seriously and to get the kind of antimicrobials coming to market that they will need in the long term. And that tiered pricing has to be locally affordable. It has to be at prices that are locally affordable, that are locally cost effective, and that will not yeah. prohibit access. I think there's another question here, though, about who is the buyer? Who, who are we talking about as the purchaser? Um, if you think about medicines procurement in general, that is not an easy answer. There are international bodies doing procurement. There are private sector distributors and uh, purchasers. There are government tenders uh, at different levels at the national, at the subnational level. Sometimes it's individual hospitals doing the purchasing. Um, 
do we have a sense of who should be doing the purchasing? And I guess my, my prior is that this is a hard thing to get to, but the ultimate thing we should have in mind and be looking for as a North Star is government purchasers from countries like India to be consolidated in purchasing on behalf of their country, to have an agenda about how they want to shape the market, to be demanding a price that's locally affordable, but also willing to pay above marginal cost in a way that helps develop this market for their long-term needs. But that's a long structural change about how countries purchase and who is doing purchasing on behalf of the country. But it also has to do with health financing, right? It is health financing being pooled at a central level um, and then our, our services being delivered free of charge at the point of service. I think that's the North Star, but I think we can also recognize that there's a lot of uh, distance between where we are and that uh, imagining. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you for highlighting that, you know, we're talking about a different beast here in terms of what global health is, is used to. So we don't have a, a global fund. We don't have, you know, um, a Gavi here. Like we're talking about countries themselves and you are highlighting very important countries, middle income countries like India. So, Kevin, you, you had a, co a comment on, on India. Do you want to share it with us? So I'm strongly in favor of, of, of all countries participating in, in drawing up the system and, and, and designing what, what we're doing here. But uh, a specific comment that Rachel had about India, I just wanted to say that for CARBEX, um, which we support the preclinical and, and phase one pipeline for many of the projects coming towards the market, um, every single therapeutic in our portfolio has been tested against very current clinical uh, samples from around the world, including many clinical samples from India. So, uh, you know, this was a uh, something that was permitted under by the Indian government, um, and and I can assure you that everything in our portfolio I can't speak for everything on the planet um, is designed to work against things that are currently clinical problems in places like India and other developing countries around the world. Um, you know, we are not developing things at Carvex that are just for high income countries, full stop. Uh, we want these things to be useful to the entire world and they will be. Thank you, Kevin. I think it is important to, you know, remember that the earlier you get countries involved, the, the, the more likely that they will actually pay um, and getting them involved in the research and development, not just in terms of the researchers, but the clinical trials and the needs is, is, is definitely a must. Anthony, you, you also had a comment about, you know, um, this new system and middle income countries. Um, please, over to you. Uh, thank you, Javier. So I'm not sure if we need one system or several, but it, whatever the system ends up looking like, it should vary based on whether drugs are on patent or not and whether countries wealth. But what I kind of like us to see in the end is in high income countries, something like the NHS pilot, where the NHS now purchases two drugs based on a subscription model. So it pays 10 million pounds a year, regardless of how much those drugs are used. So if we need those drugs a lot, the government does quite well. And if those drugs aren't needed because resistance is low, we still provide payment to the companies based on some kind of insurance value. The US is looking at doing something similar on a much bigger scale um, due to the Pasteur Act, which Kevin is much more involved in than I am. Um, um, and I would hope that the European Union and Japan and other high income parts of the world lead the innovation uh, to their segment. But then, uh, as Rachel says, there's scope for middle income countries to play a role here too, particularly because high income countries have been slow and the burden uh, is predominantly on, on middle income countries and countries like Brazil and India can set the global agenda and they should not be paying more than they can afford. Uh, but we can think about ways of generating incentives to meet those needs. Um, and then I, ideally in the long run, I mean, we're not registering third line antibiotics in countries like Malawi or Ethiopia. And, and we need to find a way to fund access to those drugs uh, or at the very least to get them there on cost. And um, in lots of areas of medicine, we have specific purchasing agreements uh, such as the Global Fund. Um, I don't know if we need something similar in antimicrobials, but we certainly need to think harder about how we make sure that people get drugs to those who have multi-resistant infections in the poorest countries in the world. And so we need to string those three things together, either into one system or into three separate systems, is kind of my opinion. 
Thank you, Anthony. And, and you mentioned something um, that is an innovation in high income countries, you know, the subscription models uh, and, you know, delinking this volume from, from price. Uh, Murphy, you, you wanted to comment on it. You want to give some remarks on how appropriate these models could be for low and middle income countries. Is this something that, you know, is there, is there any, you know, promise there? Over to you, Murphy. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. So, you know, the, um, most of these models, when we look at, uh, at subscription models examples, whether we're looking at actually Sweden, we're looking at the UK, we're looking at countries that are um, able to, uh, to put in a lot of public funding into, into these, um, uh, uh, these sort of actually uh, innovative ways. And um, you've got, you've got uh, uh, these countries have got actually very strong uh, uh, insurance companies and, uh, you know, uh, those agreements that can actually, uh, um, that can actually, you know, uh, uh, cover a number of these, uh, uh, of these antibiotics. But uh, the reality of it is that, you know, in most low uh, uh, income countries and some, you know, um, some middle income countries, uh, uh, the expenses are out of pocket. You know, uh, most are going to be out of pocket, you know, uh, pocket expenses. And, and that's where a number of these models, when you look at them in a critical sense, become very challenging to see how it can work. Whether it's a subscription model, it's very difficult. Where we have seen uh, 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 most governments, for example, in the African region, uh, uh, they've gone down in health expenditure. You know, you know uh, 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 most of them are actually under 10% now. But so that, um, you know, but I think when we're talking about the grand bargain, they really have to be, you know, a part of this conversation. And one group I think that is also critical uh, that we tend to actually forget are children and children formulations that are really critical. We focus a lot on adults. And so, you know, uh, uh, that's why I think, you know, uh, uh, this new bargain really should be able to actually establish, uh, you know, a, a global prioritization, you know, a strong coordination, and really looking at the funding needs and also, you know, uh, you know, uh, 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 research-driven R and D, and ensure that uh, we can find a way to be able to uh, uh, to move these molecules to register them to be able to have them available, affordable in any setting. But that also, you know, it's uh, uh, what you had mentioned earlier. It also depends really on the GDPs of the country, you know, you know, uh, uh, can they afford? And so, you know, uh, there are really a number, of, a number of pieces we need to get together. The beginning of this conversation is good and we have to move together. Even like, I mean, actually Kevin said, you know, every country must be involved. Because at the end of the day, you know, uh, we are only as strong and can only address issues of AMR if every country is actually involved. Thank you. Thank you, Murphy. And, and you have already started to talk about the challenges. Um, and you, you, you talked about, you know, what about countries where there's a lot of, you know, out-of-pocket expenditure? What about countries that have, you know, low um, healthcare s s expenditure per capita? Um, and... and, and I wanted to ask Fatima, uh, is there any other big obstacle that you see in terms of, you know, changing the way um, antimicrobials are procured in low and middle income countries at the moment? What, what other obstacles we should be thinking of? Over to you, Fatima. Yeah, I think the one thing that I would really like to emphasize and this addresses a few of the points that were made by the other panelists is that it's not only a matter of getting antibiotics over to these countries, but getting the right antibiotics to these populations and really having the right level of data to understand the trends, to understand where um, certain drugs are needed. And as I mentioned initially, is that of the uh, 166 medicines, um, only a third have strategies to actually provide access to these medicines, to these drugs. And so while on patents are doing quite well in terms of having access strategies associated with them, comparatively speaking, the generic medicines that are the access medicines per the WHO that are necessary to be the first line treatments are not readily available. And so if you treat people with the wrong medicines, you're going to only push 
and spread more AMR. Um, and so this is where it's important for stakeholders, including governments <clears throat> and including the um, pharmaceutical industry, as well as procurement agencies to have the right level of data on hand to understand where demand and how to provide that supply. So it's a much more targeted approach that we need as well. It's not just a matter of getting these drugs out, but getting the right drugs out at the right time. Thank you. Thank you for, for, for that comment in terms of appropriateness and timeliness. Um, so we're getting comments from, from, from the audience. Please do submit your questions. Um, but before we actually get to, you know, answer um, some other comments from the audience, just, just wanted to, to ask you, um, Rachel, you know, is there any, you know, we've already talked about data, about um, income, about, you know, the importance of having a global conversation. Why is it so difficult? Like, what are the, the steps that we should take to make this happen? Is there any comment on you know addressing the obstacles over to you that's a big question javier um yeah i mean I, I think it's complicated and it's i think part of the complication here is that there are so many different players we're not talking about one company and one buyer and the negotiation between them we are talking about a very dynamic environment with hundreds of purchasers and hundreds of sellers of different types um, and the, the prescribing uh, practices of you know, thousands and millions of hospitals and providers. So we're talking about a very big ecosystem of people who need to be involved in this discussion, are impacted by this discussion, and that's, of course, before you even get to the patients themselves, who are the, the ones who ultimately need these, these drugs. I don't think there's any easy shortcuts here. Um, I think this is Unfortunately, a structural health systems issue. There, are, what we're talking about today, these purchasing systems are part of it. On some level, they are maybe the easier part. Um, I think we're seeing some momentum towards reform of antibiotic purchasing already. Uh, you referenced the Pasteur Act, which is quite an exciting development. Um, I think there is increasingly attention on this issue at that level, but. The process of getting everyone engaged in this conversation is it's a long term uh, progressive discussion. And I think we need to treat it that way, not expect to find the one solution, but start tackling bit by bit, piece by piece, the different dimensions of this problem from different angles. Um, and so I'm glad we're talking today about the kind of purchasing and procurement. It's only one part of a very large discussion. Um, and I think we at CGD are, have some humility about how small it potentially is as part of this broader discussion. It is not the be all end all on this issue. But I think all you can do is, is start working on something and hopefully enough people will start working on different things that collectively we will solve this problem from the different angles. Thank you, Rachel, for putting perspective to this conversation and for you know really letting us know and addressing this, this issue of you know, long-term and ambitiousness. Um, we're getting to, to the end of this, of this interesting conversation. I just wanted to give everyone the opportunity to, you know, provide, you know, a one minute final remark, um, any takeaway for our audience, any takeaway from this conversation. Um, Kevin, you want to get started first? Uh, two quick ones. If, if you look around the world, what's saving lives in many settings are oral generic antibiotics. And one huge gap um, in the, in the R&D pipeline is who is actually researching and creating the next generation of these oral antibiotics that are used in many settings. Now, the second thing I'll say is that, um, you know, in, in a lot of this conversation about procurement, uh, some of the most interesting conversations I think are happening at GuardP and with the SECURE project at WHO. I know that they're part of this working group largely. Uh, they're not on the panel today. But uh, very interesting work, and, and we really need to pay attention carefully uh, to that excellent uh, activity there. Thank you, Kevin. Um, Fatima, do you want to go next? Sure, of course. Um, just on that note, I think it's very important that the stakeholders convene and that everyone's 
opinions and perspectives are brought to the table because as mentioned there are many stakeholders involved in this and it's going to require a concerted effort by governments by procurement agencies by the pharmaceutical industry um, as well as by an, an understanding of what the needs of those vulnerable populations are so that we are conserving these antibiotics as well as pushing innovation towards the right antibiotics where there are gaps where there are needs and then protecting these drugs and so it's a, it's a concerted effort and i think we need to make sure that everyone's at the table thank you um rachel i think it just in talking about this as an antimicrobial issue, I think we need to recognize, and we've talked about this quite a bit, just how closely connected this is to just many normal, quote unquote, health system issues. This is a question of efficient drug registration systems and regulatory harmonization to some extent. It is a question about effective primary care systems and hospital systems, access to diagnostics, um, di diagnostic capacity and health financing as a whole. How are drugs in general being purchased and made affordable to patients and end users? So this really needs to be part of the broader conversation. There are antimicrobial specific considerations around, especially for this new generation. And the stewardship question is to some extent unique to antimicrobials. But a lot of the solutions are health system solutions. They're the same solutions. They're the same structural issues as treating any number of diseases out there. So when we talk about these issues, let's let's focus on antimicrobials and recognize the specific problem of antimicrobials, but also recognize that many of the solutions run through the broader health system and can't be tackled in a silo. Thank you. Murphy, final words? <laughs> yeah, this, this discussion and this work uh, is happening at the very right time. Uh, uh, the other side of the uh, uh, of the room, there is this discussion around around the pandemic treaty, and uh, you know uh, that is gaining a lot of momentum. And I think the, you know uh, uh, whether we uh, are looking at that pandemic treaty and looking at the grand uh, you know uh, uh, bargain, there is a lot that we have to do. This is going to be difficult. This is not easy, but it's uh, we can really achieve and make a lot of progress. And these conversations. Uh, Really, this work needs to be encouraged, and this work uh, needs to come up with, uh, you know, uh, uh, some solutions and some recommendations that we can make. Because uh, 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 at the end of the day, we really all are committed to ensuring that uh, uh, there is equitable and sustainable access for all, and especially those that are, you know, in that last mile, and those that are, you know, in areas where it's uh, it's very difficult for them to access. Uh, you know, uh, uh, um, any of these antimicrobials. And of course, uh, I think the, 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 the more we strengthen our health systems, uh, uh, it, will, it will actually complement and solve a number of systemic issues, uh, you know, uh, that also are actually existential because of really very weak health systems uh, uh, that we have. And sometimes, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the misalignment that we have in, uh, uh, in terms of R&D and getting uh, uh, these molecules out. Thank you. Thank you, Murphy. Anthony, one sentence, 30 seconds. Um, uh, thank you very much for listening to us today. I would say that, you know, we're in a moment, COVID has shown how bad infectious diseases can be. And hopefully we take this forward to build global consensus. And it seems like what's happening in the US and in the UK and with Guard P, uh, is, you know, there's a there's a chance for progress and, and I hope that we can progress it. And if you have thoughts or want to engage in the working group in any way, we're trying to be as consensus and group led as possible. So please get in touch. My email is on CGD's website. We're always happy to engage with anyone. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you for our audience. I guess, you know, the bottom line final takeaway is you know, there is a huge problem with antimicrobial resistance. It's silent, it's growing, it affects mainly low and middle income countries. And we need to think about new ways to, not just new ways to procure antibiotics. It's a, it's, of course, the problem is bigger, but in terms of our narrower scope, um, thinking about access in innovation and stewardship is, is the right way to go. We see a lot of progress. 
And we'll be working on these issues, trying to provide, you know, actionable policy recommendations, incorporating all this, you know, good advice that we're getting from our panelists and from these discussions. So thank you very much for joining CGT and I hope you have a good rest of the day. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you.